So uh, uh, thank you uh, to everybody to be here. My name is Hugues Aubin. I am vice president of the French Fab Lab Network. Uh, France is not a very big country, but uh, we have about 238 Fab Labs in this country, perhaps the most uh, of Fab Labs per people uh, in the world. And uh, we are very happy to uh, host today and to, to organize with the Fab Foundation and Fab this event um, about open health. Um, we, we wanted to organize that because we noticed in France during the COVID crisis that we were very useful, not as makers, but as a, um, a kind of organization uh, making uh, connections uh, between needs from people of health sector, um, people drawing, making research and development of solutions in open source ecosystem, um, people um, um, sending good information, not to only Fab Labs, but to companies, industrials, and especially makers networks, all these thousands of people with their 3D printers. And then we discovered also that we have many problems concerning local logistics to put all these strange things in the end of the people. And um, the way we try to solve some problems in France, we discovered that it was a problem of processes. And in, in this problem, we discovered that it was possible to set up a kind of chains um, making circles between needs, research and development, information spreading, digital fabrication, use, and then to make it again, not only on personal protection equi equipment, but also in concerning things and objects that were totally uh, forbidden to conceive and to uh, make in the normal condition of the health system. I mean, the problem, for example, to make legal medical devices. That's why today we would like also to make connections, but between continents uh, in, this, in this conference, because we will hear some great pioneers uh, and great people from the world of health, from Africa, from India, from USA, from Europe, people from the maker networks, people from the Fab Lab networks, people from the health sector, to think what are perhaps the key points that could on planet Earth make the people able to take care of, of themselves by connecting the needs with health problems or solutions to a kind of fab village or fab city or distributed system uh, working in the, for the health uh, sector. So first, I will give, um, I will ask to Vaibhav, if he's, Vaibhav, are you with us? Vaibhav, Shabra. Hey, you're good. Yes. I'm yes, Vaibhav. So uh, I'm very happy, uh, and I will give uh, now the talk to uh, Vaibhav Shabra, who is uh, uh, somebody that many people know on planet Earth. And uh, Vaibhav, just four questions to begin. Who are you? What? Why? And uh, your community uh, was involved in the COVID crisis. And uh, how could we imagine to go further, not only about the COVID, but about the health care with uh, our ecosystem. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, would it be possible if I show some uh, images on the side? So can I share my yes, screen? Yes, we have Doji. Doji yes. is a new DJ. Yeah, you can. OK, perfect. Now I do have access. There we go. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. OK, perfect. So uh, real quick. Uh, Hi, I'm Vebhuv Chawra. I run a community makerspace in Mumbai called Makers Asylum. This is a little bit of how the space looks. It's uh, 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 one of the programs that we're running right now in the space, so that you can see some a lot of action. Uh, inside the space, we have a fully functional metal shop, a fully functional wood shop, a laser cutting lab, bunch of 3D printers, 
electronics, a beautiful terrace, and uh, a barbecue that we made, where we do a lot of barbecues and have a good time. However, what we really primarily focus on is access to learning and access to tools. So when I say access to learning, it's a, a lot about the different kind of programs that we do at the space. Uh, Hugh and has also been here. We've done uh, the Fabricarium program over here with differently abled community. We've done uh, uh, different programs around SDGs and we teach a lot of young ones and adults all the time. So pretty much like most fab labs and naked spaces. Uh, so I'm just gonna skip some stuff, but what we, this is sort of what we primarily focus on. And uh, that's one of the programs with Hugh. So Steam Fabricarium, Steam School, Dive. Dive is another program where a lot of uh, students from a French business school called EM Lyon, they send us about a hundred students every year to Mumbai to learn about frugal innovation and making. Uh, and they spend two months in Mumbai. There is SDG school that we do every year in Paris. We fly down to Paris and run a program for one month over there. But however, as most of us know, uh, what happened with COVID is that we had to shut down our space and uh, uh, all the programs for the year got canceled. And Makers Asylum is a self-funded, uh, completely self-sustaining lab. So what I mean by that is that we pay rent, we pay electricity, we do all of that. We don't have any sponsor that's holding us. So that means we're completely independent in the way that we function and the way we grow uh, for the past seven years now. So for us, when the space, uh, when the lockdown happened uh, on the 23rd of March in India, it was uh, a big issue for the reason that we didn't know how to react because financially as well, it would have been a problem and otherwise as well. So instead of going home, most of our team and ourselves, we decided to lock ourselves inside the space. So we closed the shutter down and we got our bags and we started sleeping at Maker's Asylum from uh, the 23rd of March. And initially, this was one of the first posts that we threw out. We tried to prototype some face shields, like most other labs. And we threw out the first prototype on the 21st, uh, 25th of March, where we uh, made a simple one out of wood and came up with some exciting design ways on how to make them using a laser cutter instead of 3D printers, because most people were making them with 3D printers, but in India, there aren't too many 3D printers, but there is a full industry of laser cutting everywhere in the small villages, towns, everywhere. So we were able to bring the cost down of a face shield to under 75 cents and uh, be able to create these at a much larger scale, much more quickly. So that's what we realized that there is a huge need in India as well uh, as the pandemic was hitting India. And uh, there was a huge shortage of PPE equipment and face shields. Uh, and in India, face shields weren't made here before. So we really got to work. Initially, we thought that we'll make 10,000 face shields um, at Maker's Asylum. But as some of you might have known, we ended up making over 1 million in 49 days. Uh, as of today, we've almost crossed over 2 million uh, shields within the network of labs. How did we do this? So uh, what happened is when we made our first batch of 500 shields, we realized how badly choked the entire logistics system is in India. When I mean about the logistics system, I mean the delivery system. We tried to deliver 500 shields to Bangalore, a neighboring city, and it took three days for them to receive it. And that's when we realized that it's really, really, I mean, we can't work this way in a time like this, the doctors require their face shields today, not three days later. So, um, and we had ambulances coming to Makers Asylum to pick up face shields. We had uh, uh, police cars coming to Makers Asylum to pick up face shields. So we decided that the only way to possibly do this is by distributing the entire network. And uh, what we did is we completely open source the design. We'd made a lot of videos on how other labs and other makers could copy the design and quickly start making it based on the learnings that we had. Because we worked with at least about 10 doctors before we came up with the final design. And uh, uh, this is something that we made, the first one. Uh, one of the exciting things about this was that when we started, we started with wood and acrylic, but wood is porous as a material. Acrylic is heavy and brittle as a material. And finally, we landed up on a material called foam board, 
which is super cheap, super light, flexible, and easily cuttable on a laser cutter. And uh, this was definitely the aha moment for us uh, when it came to scaling it, because we were able to give this to all the labs and it's commonly used in marketing materials. So it was very easy for us to take this same settings and pass it on and give them all the knowledge that they can start making them really quickly in their local cities and giving it to their hospitals. We went through about 21 design iterations before we got to where we did. And we, in the process, also worked with all the other labs to quickly keep developing and making the designs better as we went along and as we learned more. Um, so this is just a quick chart of how uh, the collective grew. So what was happening was that while we were making in Makers Asylum, we were making phone calls and activating and posting on social media and activating a lot of other makers and labs across the country. So if you look at it, the graph is sort of going at almost a, a very steep curve where it's reaching uh, a million in 49 days. So the first 100,000 facials, just to give you a perspective, took us 15 days. The next 100,000 facial took seven days after that. There was a point towards the end when we were making 100,000 facials a day. To just give you a perspective. Uh, this is sort of uh, one of our friends who was following us. He did a nice little uh, demarcation and figuring out as to what was happening. And over here, you can see the yellow line is Makers Asylum, which was like the consistent one. But then there were other labs coming in and doing different, different things and improving processes, going faster, making more at a very, very rapid scale as well. Some were slower, some were high. But what was really exciting was that Makers Asylum was probably not the fastest or did not produce the most amount of shields in India, but we were able to garner a strength of the collective through the M19 initiative and have uh, produced the million at a very fast pace. And just to give you a perspective, we had the north of India, which is like Jammu and Kashmir, to the south of India, to the east of India, uh, uh, to the west of India, every part of India was covered. Uh, so wherever the doctors or wherever the hospital was having a difficulty in PPE equipment, we could supply it. And that was what was exciting about the entire initiative. Another very important thing that I would like to mention is that there was a very diverse group of people who got together uh, to be able to give this, uh, to be able to be a part of this initiative. Everywhere from filmmakers to magazine editors to uh, neuropsychologists to a Goldman Sachs analyst to uh, people from very, very different backgrounds. They were the youngest member of the M19 collective was 12 years old, just to give you a perspective. So people from all different ages, groups, backgrounds were a part of this initiative to make the um, million shields happen. Uh, we obviously did a lot of crowdfunding campaigns. Uh, we ourselves raised over $40,000. And apart from that, we set down a price for it so that we put a price tag to the shield so that people could support us by uh, either funding on the crowdfunding campaign or buying it directly or buying it and donating it further or foundations could buy it from us. So there were multiple things going out uh, because we were able to put down a specific price right at the beginning, which included, uh, which was at about 75 cents, including a small amount to, for us to be able to sustain and all the labs to be able to sustain during these times as well. So we weren't only growing in that way, but we were also self-sustainable and the entire initiative was self-sustainable, I would say from the beginning. Um, also, I'm not sure if you heard about this outside of India, but there was a huge, huge problem in India when it came to the migrant workers, because in India, we have a huge population of daily wages and uh, people who are having a very difficult time with the entire lockdown because of the fact that they were not able to go back home. So there were hundreds of thousands of laborers that were stranded in the uh, urban cities of India trying to go back home to their villages. And... Uh, we also were able to supply over 100,000 shields to them so that they could stay safe in those times while they had to be where they had to be and cook and serve other people. We also made baby shields. We also served uh, the police force. Uh, pretty much most of the police force was wearing the M19 shield that was being made by most of our labs. And uh, we were able to sell them out. Post that, most of the other labs also diversified. 
we started making PAPR, so I have it right here, but I can show it to you if you have more time, where uh, a PAPR is a purified air respirator. So it basically gives you fresh ventilated air right on your hood using uh, what you can see in my hand in that photograph, uh, which is uh, an air filter based blowing unit that we made inside the lab. We've already made over 10 of these and they've started going out to hospitals and uh, we're sending them out as soon as possible. We've been getting a lot of requests for the same. Um, if I, Hugh, how am I doing on time? Do I have a time for a quick little video? Yes, yeah, so how long the video? Two minutes. Okay. Yeah. Let's okay. go. Let me show you guys. Uh, this just got ready today. Uh, so, hence, I would be super excited to show it to you. Oops. Uh, can I? Why did I screen share? Okay, perfect. So, this just got ready today. It's a little video of the M19 Collective, and I just wanted to show you our little uh, chance through India and how we did what we did. Today's day 49 of the M19 Collective, and together, a wartime effort to be able to ensure that every medical staff is testing against the unavailability of PPE care. To 8,000 personal protection kits left in the Delhi government stock. Today is day seven. Good. Multiple designs. Four cities have caught on. They're making 1,000 shields today. We ended up making 2,200. And we tried multiple versions overnight. In fact, like Nagpur, Mohit, and Ravi from Jaipur to join the call. They call M19. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you a lot, uh, Faiba. Uh, we have um, um, two questions on the, on the chat. Perhaps you can answer quickly. Um, uh, so we've, we've got precise question about, um, about the, the duty cycle uh, of the mask. Um, uh, William is asking if uh, the users are reusing and disinfecting the masks. And uh, you can see also that he asked a little questions about the new uh, purifier uh, respirator. 
uh, asking if uh, they have uh, an alarm uh, for a low voltage. Sure. So this is the mask. This is the face shield, the first part of the question. So what we've done over here is we made a simple way to actually throw away this part, which is the PET, like most other designs, how they evolved across the world. Uh, and this part is made out of PET, uh, sorry, sorry pro polypropylene and can be mm. disinfected and soap water solution. And that's what we're advising to the hospitals. So they use, they end up reusing this part. They end up throwing that, which is recyclable. Uh, the second part about uh, the PAPRs, uh, in terms of the low flow and the low voltage audible alarm, yes, the moment the battery goes below a certain amount, there is an alarm. Secondly, we also have, uh, um, we are also working on a, a filtration alarm, which most other PAPRs don't have, because in India, one of the big problems is the fact that uh, uh, there is a shortage of filters at the moment as well. So what we're doing is that so as to optimize the use of each and every filter, the moment the filters start to clog up and uh, that, so on a respirator, passive respirator, you're able to sort of uh, uh, notice the breathing difference. And that's when you know you have to throw away your uh, filter and replace the filter. But however, in an active one, it's hard to know because you're getting a constant flow and the motor is sucking it in. But however, it does make a voltage change so we are actually putting an alarm for that too, so that whenever you notice any sort of voltage stain, there is a way to figure out whether the filters are clogging or not. Thank you a lot. So um, uh, I have some questions, but I prefer to keep them for the debate phase, um, yes. um, uh, especially questions concerning um, the way you were, for example, walking or not, with the authorities, with the government, or with the hospitals, because it was a very critical point in France. Um, and uh, we, we had to use very strange local strategies to make things legal and to spread the models uh, in the different regions. So now, uh, thank you a lot, V. Please stay with us for the debate phase and uh, bravo uh, <laughs> to all the team. Um, uh, Medar, uh, alors, I, I, must, uh, I must say that Medar Agbayazon, who is the president of the West African Fab Lab Networks, uh, is replaced by Doji because he is uh, sick, uh, paludism uh, for some days, but it's not some, uh, he, he will be on the, his legs in some days. It's not, uh, uh, don't be afraid for him. But uh, uh, we have the luck to have Doji Honu uh, with us. And uh, so Doji is also a very important member of the, of the desk of the West African network. I know very well. So Doji, please, can you uh, speak to us about uh, what is happening in West Africa, the action you are uh, making, and uh, perhaps a word on the Maker North South project you are setting up. Doji? Okay, uh, thank you, Ud, and thank you, everyone. My name is Doji uh, from Côte d'Ivoire. I'm based in Côte d'Ivoire. I'm the general secretary of the network, uh, French, uh, I mean, the, the lab uh, network in West Africa. Uh, we have about uh, 20 uh, fab labs in eight countries in West Africa. And basically, we're working in education, uh, ed tech, entrepreneurship. And based on the demand and the needs, uh, we can adapt our activities to, to those specific uh, needs. And during the pandemics, uh, all the network will, uh, was mobilized to, to find solutions for the COVID. And basically, we, we did the same things like uh, we did in India uh, by, uh, product, um, by making a mask, uh, for, uh, using 3D printers, uh, laser cutter and digital uh, embroidery machine and face shield also. Uh, some of the lab develop uh, automatic and mechanical wash, uh, washing machine, washing hand machine and, uh, um, and a mechanical gel, um, gel dispenser. Yes. So, for example, yeah, for is up in Togo and Mali, Burkina Faso, they they were starting to to prototype uh, a ventilator, 
uh, but as uh, you said earlier that uh, regarding the, the legislation, the, the law, it's very hard to have a final uh, product like as a ventilator. So, uh, but they're still working on it with the government and, and some local university to improve uh, those machines and maybe uh, after the COVID, uh, it can be used uh, in the in, in our hospital because it's a, a frequent. I mean, this is uh, it. We need the, those machines not only for COVID, but so you can see that in our uh, in our medical center, some of, some tools are I mean are, are missed, and we we need we need those tools. So uh, regarding the prison mechanism suit against uh, coronavirus. It's, uh, I can say, a, a joint venture or uh, an association uh, with uh, the, our network in West Africa, uh, in French uh, organizations like uh, French uh, networks of Fab Labs and many others uh, organizations in, in, uh, in, in France. And the aim of this project is to provide like uh, tools, materials uh, to those labs in West Africa uh, to allow them to produce more, more, um, more face shields, uh, more masks, uh, and even uh, go beyond the, uh, go after the the, the, the the pandemic to develop like uh, open uh, open health, like open uh, health uh, tools, like ventilators, like specific tools that we can use in in hospital that we can we we don't have actually. So uh, this is uh, basically the project, and uh, we um, we actually made a, crowd, a crowdfunding. So with uh, international institution in France, uh, and we uh, we like actually with the Fondation de France, uh, we got like uh, twenty five thousand euros, uh, one part of the project. And we will start to, to, to provide equipment to two fab labs in Benin, so one of the countries, and another one in, in Senegal. So that's basically what we are doing. And so with the network, um, um, uh, international network in France and other in USA, so most of the time for regarding the, the face shields and the mask uh, prototyping so we use the open source one that was shared by the the, the network uh, and we, we adapt to our local context and replicate them to distribute to the hospital and uh, some ngos on uh, local uh, local communities uh, in different countries so this is Thank you a lot, Doji. Uh, some very interesting things. Uh, you are uh, a network involving uh, more than 10 countries, I think, for yes. some things and more than 25 or 30 uh, Fab Labs. Yes. And uh, uh, we will speak about that with John Shaw uh, and with uh, David. Um, but uh, well, I, I discovered that uh, uh, there, there were some specific uh, very interesting things uh, in Africa. First, uh, we've seen that Vibav made a huge action, but uh, uh, an action about uh, personal protection equipment. I discovered in Africa many, many projects about the prevention, the fact that uh, you, you, you wash your hand in the street with uh, automatic gel providers yeah. or a soap with water systems, very yeah. efficient that you can make work with your feet mechanically. And there were also many people sewing masks, working with the people of the labs, uh, okay. using, um, uh, using the same places from, um, and in France, it was the same thing about the, the people sewing the mask where many thousands of people, perhaps the first on the field at the beginning of the COVID crisis. And one question that uh, we will speak later, so please uh, stay with us is, the essential question of the cost of the medical devices uh, because we'll speak about that and it is a problem uh, everywhere but it, it is a particular problem in the countries where you can't afford 
uh, especially in hospitals and in public hospitals, something, or you can't, even if you imagine it and you design it, you can't have the right to make it, to legalize it, and to use it. And so that's uh, the thing I, I hope you'll speak with us, especially concerning Africa. Um, because um, it's something very important to understand that uh, you can have good ideas, you can have good, good things designed, and perhaps 90% of the whole population of the planet can't afford it or uh, can't uh, have access to it, even if it can be designed, built, and used, uh, because it's not legal or it's, not, it's too expensive. So uh, I think uh, that as Roberto will come back in about 15 minutes, um, I think is Philippe Cochin with us. Philippe, you are here? Oui, oui, je suis là, je suis là. Uh, Great. So um, uh, Philippe, um, I'm very I, happy I, you I, are I, here. So if you are ready, um, I, I quickly uh, uh, say that we are very happy to you, that you are with us because you, you were working on, on a project that was not a maker project at the beginning, but uh, who was a project launched by uh, professionals of the health sector and perhaps the biggest in France because it's the uh, Paris hospitals. So thank you a lot because we need to understand and to, to look uh, closer the way that the professional had perhaps to make a connection to new solutions and way to uh, make things with digital fabrication tools in a time that was not uh, the time they were uh, used to have. And also, uh, if you agree, I would like you to speak to us about the question of clinical validation that okay. you, uh, you were working on and that worked in France with Paris hospitals and was very, very useful uh, for uh, some makers' designs. So Philippe, um, who are you? Okay. What is the project and what are your views? So, um, um, yeah, so to present myself is always kind of a problem, but uh, so I am Philippe Cochin. Uh, I have done a lot of various uh, things in very various fields. So um, uh, I did use uh, 3D printing for professional uh, for, for jewelry making. So I know advanced uh, uh, modelization and this kind of, of stuff. Uh, I have been uh, doing uh, around 50 humanitarian missions uh, around Southeast Asia mostly, so India, uh, Cambodia, Burma, all those places. Uh, so it's government to government, so we pretty much uh, have the health government uh, interfacing and asking uh, what is needed at what place. Uh, and then we go there and we build infrastructure, we send equipment, uh, we pretty much raise so like in India, for example, I, I was in Bhopal, uh, I was in, I met the guy with Jaipur food, those kind of guy. Um, so I also have a French NGO. So my family, uh, before the French Revolution, so a very long time ago, uh, built the Cochin Hospital, which is one of the largest of Paris right now. Um, so I am uh, kind of born into this like hospital family and hospital world. Um, so what happened is that I was in, um, uh, I was in Singapore working on, I was doing quantum physics actually in Singapore when it started, when the COVID started. So uh, once I, I came back, so Singapore was the second country with the most cases at the beginning. Uh, and, and so I started to look what I could do with my NGOs and what could be done. Uh, so like the crisis in France was like kind of, kind of bad because like all the, in, um, People who take decisions were completely saturated by information and people asking for help and offering help. And, and it was like very difficult for the French health, uh, healthcare system. And there was some very strong shortage of uh, PPE, like uh, masks and stuff. Um, so like what we did is that we, we like the French army called the uh, DGA, uh, started uh, to ask for help pretty much. And we did a, a first project uh, where I thought uh, we could use uh, 3D printing uh, to, uh, to, to build what, what was lacking. Also, it was a very tense 
situation internationally. Uh, so the Americans were stealing the mask, uh, like we stole one million masks that was designed to come to France on the Chinese airport, and and we also did steal stuff. So it was like very very tense, you know. Uh, I, I think we we need to remember this. Uh, so um, so we built this project. So in 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 four days we we managed to raise uh, around um, like. Two plus five around like let's say uh, three four million euros, um, and we managed to convince uh, one one hundred thousand uh, people organization APHP, which is the French hospital, um, to buy uh, a stock of uh, semi-industrial 3D printers uh, to be independent and to be resilient and to be autonomous, pretty much uh, on all those supplies. Um, so. Uh, maybe I, we can switch to the uh, screen sharing so I can show you. Um, okay, um, can you activate the screen sharing, please? Okay, no screen sharing. Okay, so anyways. Um, <laughs> so, so all those printers arrived uh, in um, uh, in Paris, they were set up and they started to print uh, in like three days. So uh, between the moment the decision was taken uh, and the moment we started to produce things, it was like a very, very short time. Um, so then we, we started to have a lot of demands for a lot of like most of the maker community did care about um, PPE and this kind of stuff. Uh, but we had all the medics with a like very big scientific uh, council with a lot of medics and, and like people who are on the field. And so they really uh, ask us for a lot of parts we are starting to miss in the hospital. So, for example, like, like something that was fun was uh, um, at some point there was this, um, in, in France, it's a very uh, classical mask. Uh, and we thought we could uh, use it uh, as a like uh, PP or a ventilator for patients. So you put it like this, and it got very. <laughs> it, it, it's uh, it's uh, for diving, so it's it's uh, very waterproof and everything. And so to have connectors that like this connector that could uh, uh, adapt on the mask. Um, so uh, so with all of this, we had. Uh, a lot of, of designers and people from the uh, civil society which wanted to contrib contribute. So we had a very big influx of engineers, designers, uh, makers, people from like all walks of life which will, we were like helping the healthcare system uh, for free. Uh, makers were a big part of it. So this was like very nice and hospitals uh, really enjoyed uh, having the population kind of, of uh, go with them. Um, so also there's a lot of other stuff like we needed to print. So for example, uh, all that is like uh, repairs. Uh, so you could have a very expensive piece of equipment that breaks and, and it's like, I don't know, 500 euros and there's only bits of plastic which is missing and broke. And so then we can uh, also repair. Uh, so uh, also there's also all the handicap and orthopedics and parametric medicine, all those kind of stuff. Um, then in the future, what I see in the future is, um, uh, so in France, we've got a lot of uh, things moving for like uh, open hardware. So there were al already a few projects that started before like uh, Ecopen, which is like a ETO stethoscope. Uh, also, uh, we had a very uh, high grade uh, syringe pump, which was designed. Uh, so syringe pump right now in France, is, it, it costs about 3,000 euros and it's pretty much a NEMA 17 motor uh, pushing uh, uh, syringe. Um, so we can, we manage to lower the cost to something like 60 euros. Uh, so any patient will need to have a syringe pump and a ventilator. Uh, and usually it's like four syringe pump, let's say. Uh, um, so also, we design a pretty high-grade ventilator in France, so open source and everything. And both are uh, going to use the same components, so it, it can be like repaired and, and upgraded very fast. The idea will be to have a, a, a very uh, like low-cost, high-grade uh, ICU unit, uh, which will be very useful for our missions. Uh, so in remote parts, a lot of death happen because of lack of um, ICU. Uh, and so if we can provide uh, and, and this was all designed by very top-notch French engineers and international engineers. 
So if we can provide after COVID also uh, both like low cost, high grade IC units, um, it could save uh, uh, a lot of life. Um, so also I, I see things evolving towards uh, parametric medicine. So all the printers uh, that we have uh, right now uh, don't, don't make face shields anymore because we kind of have enough pretty much. Uh, so now they are being uh, reused for uh, research and, and now we are kind of moving um, where they design the equipment they want and how they want it to work and all of this. Um, so this is very interesting because uh, it means that uh, the, the, the hospital uh, designs and creates his own stuff as he wants uh, and doesn't have to choose, uh, you know, from a catalog or something. Um, like you can check, there's a lot of, of design we, we put in open source that are available at this address. I will link to it in a sec. Uh, yeah. If you want to check some of them. Um, what else? Uh, yes, and the problem uh, we encountered, uh, so the biggest problem was validation. So what happens is uh, on the other side of, of, so you are on the maker side and the healthcare system side, uh, everything has to be validated with some very, very strong uh, rules. Uh, and it's 100 pages for any small connector of whatever. Uh, and so the, the rubber stampers, the guy who validates the pharmacologists who validate this kind of stuff, don't uh, are not used to iterative design cycles and like fast prototyping and all those like uh, 4.0 new industry things. Um, so we had a very <laughs> big fight, like not fight, but you know, like discussion with them on how we could improve um, the whole like industrial um, healthcare industry system. Uh, to work in a much more uh, lean and and fast way while being serious, you know. Um, so it's like standardization and testing materials. And so we had a, a very, very big discussion around this. Um, what else? The other problem we had was logis logistics. So since there was lockdown, it was uh, being difficult to have uh, materials uh, like uh, uh, filament and stuff coming in and delivering uh, masks and stuff. Uh, so this was another problem uh, and what else uh, i guess i'm i'm done with my time uh, i'll also play it on me ah uh, uh meet you sorry thank uh, you philippe okay okay <laughs> um uh thank you a lot so this was an official project of uh uh, Paris Hospitals Association, which is the biggest in France, and in less yes, than uh, one week, uh, yes. There was like four main people at the origin of it. It was uh, Roman Gonsari, which is a, a yes. surgeon, uh, which works with 3D. There was uh, Jeremy Adam, which is uh, um, which did care of, of the, like his uh, company, which takes care of the printer stuff. Uh, me mm -hmm. and Guillaume Tassin. Yes. Great, big up to the team. But uh, what is very interesting is that not only you 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 you, you, you not only took designs to mm. make it in the hospital with the uh, first and the biggest uh, professional 3D farm ever uh, made in France, yes, but also you, yes, but also you 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 were you were able to have serious people who could provide clinical validation and uh, documents uh, explaining to the people how to use it safely. And so it was very, very useful because you also provided it to makers group about uh, for everybody in France, so more than uh, five to 7,000 people making things around for the people around and not only for personal protection equipment, for, but for anything uh, that you could provide uh, concerning yes. the needs of the of the people in the hospitals to anybody who wanted to have safe informations, safe models. And I must say to the people that as in many countries in France, you could have a legal validation yes. of uh, a legal clinical validation of new objects during the emergency, uh, 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 sanitary emergency. When sanitary emergency Close, closes, mm. the devices are not more legal. The second thing, and we'll speak about it later, is that mm. 
In France, for example, even if a device was legal for an hospital, it was not legal nor illegal for mm. another hospital at the other side of France. So we discovered that we had problems to know the stocks, we had problems to validate, we had problems to make the link between the people who make and the people who validate. And you spoke about the, the question of delay and of culture of iteration and open source was not the usual case in the medical mm. field. Thank you and a so, lot, Philippe. Yeah. Oui, yes? <laughs> yes, go on. I don't know. Um, yeah, just like the, the scope of a project is so large, so it's, it's pretty hard to, to sum it up. Uh, but uh, um, yes, like the, the medic and the French uh, hospital and healthcare system was pretty willing to, to work with makers and stuff. So everything we did is open source and all the process of building this uh, four days uh, huge farm uh, uh, has been documented and will be available for to be replicated pretty much wherever we want. So everything is like totally clear, uh, open source. And, and yeah. Thank you a lot. I think many people, uh, especially David, um, will be interested in, uh, interested in this uh, sharing. Uh, and because it concerns all the hospitals who want uh, to set up professional processes, including open source and uh, clinical validation. And for my part, I set up a network of uh, human labs who are fab labs involved in the foreign with disabled people uh, with Nicolas Huchet and Vibar and Doji and, and other people. And I never saw uh, an hospital himself set up an open source process with a, a clinical validation uh, that could be replicated like this. And I hope it will continue, but I must say that now nobody in France know what will continue. So um, uh, and now Roman Constari. Uh, uh, who was a surgeon who set up this process with you. So uh, now, um, as we are waiting for uh, Roberto, who is uh, coming back in uh, several minutes, uh, uh, Roberto, perhaps you are with us? Hi. Yes, no? Yes, please. Welcome, Roberto. So let's Sorry. speak. Uh, yes, no, it's great. It's great you are here. So we've heard some witnesses, especially about their local actions. But we'll keep some time for the debate phase because, you know, um, uh, one of the goal is to imagine how we could not uh, being focused only on the COVID, but on the, the way humans could find solutions like Wally and share it and build it uh, for uh, anything to take care of them. And we have people from Fab Lab Network who spoke and people from Paris Hospital. And what we saw was that the makers around us they put the fire everywhere. They were on the field everywhere, in my country, in yours, in many other countries, with any tools they had in the hand. And so uh, I know you are launching a great initiative uh, who is uh, now making a huge work in several countries. So welcome and please tell us who you are and what are Red International Maker, Roberto. Thank you. I, I would like to call it Red International Maker in Spanish. Because it's sometimes when you talk about the internationalist landscape, you always talk in English or French. That is the common languages in the international space, international society. But uh, in order to give these guy, these guys, uh, my my fellows, my compatriots, as we talk with each other, we say in Spanish, com compañero. We prefer to use um, a Spanish uh, a Spanish languages to to talk. With, with people from other countries like Scotland or <laughs> because uh, we wanted to make the, the world know that there is people all around the world willing to talk in, in their own languages and trying to break this dyna dy dynamic of international landscape always centered in Europe and all the progress made in Europe. Um, there is people interested in all over the world and in the first time we talk with the people from Latin America, the, the first thing, the first people we we make contact on on this coronavirus makers network, we we were there because we developed like 22 creations, uh, from respirators to ECMOs to AMBUS to NBQ, um, 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 defense protections and. 22 different like oximeters and all that all that kind of things. Um, we try to promote these creations 
in Latin America to make them, to produce them, to make them to, um, to develop their own uh, creations through these original creations, original, you know, open creations. But suddenly we understood that those people were clever enough to make their, their own inventions, their own creations, and we were there trying to educate someone when the real response, the real answer was, uh, okay, now we need to learn because these people is so clever. They are giving us some answers, some clues on what we are going wrong. And we have to engage with them to learn from them. In this, this change, this change in the conversation, this change in the, in the talks between the people from Latin America and Spain and other people in other countries, um, made us like change, or it, it suddenly changed our minds. And we said, okay, we, we need to change the, we need to change our, our way of thinking. We, we need to share with them. We need to learn from them. We need to understand the culture. We need to, to make, put this in context. Um, this was uh, some kind of humbling, something like uh, our opinions were made more humble uh, uh, through these conversations. And we, we, uh, we started to think in um, creating this international network with them, bringing them their resources, because they have the capacity, they have the knowledge, they have everything except the opportunity to, um, to make these creations by themselves because they, they didn't have their resources. So um, we try to, first of all, we try to share some knowledge, but give them all the tools they need to give us the opportunity to understand the change that they, they were making on our own creations. And after all, we have been working on an international lab. This international medical lab is going to bring them the opportunity to, to test their own respirators, ventilators, and everything on, with medics in Spain. They just give us the designs so they can test these, these uh, creations on patients people who is suffering COVID-19 here, in one hospital here in Spain. And also we, have, uh, we want to make a big, big open knowledge society, um, kind of Apache Software Foundation, but on open hardware for everyone to collaborate in this landscape. Always, uh, it, it's always a volunteer work, we don't work for money. We, ha we haven't given anything uh, for money in exchange or something. You know, we have produced more than 2 million, 2.5 million products, sanitary products for free, uh, asking for donations, but, but we, didn't, we never have asked for money. We only ask it for the materials to produce them. And we want to bring the opportunity to the labs, the Fab Lab, uh, lab uh, Fab Lab Foundation, the Fab Lab uh, Network, to work with us. So we talk with Beno Juarez, who is the Fab Lab coordination, is in the coordination of the Fab Labs, and ask him if we could make an event on the Fab X event for in order to create a masks uh, matching, open matching to produce these masks. So it's, it's ongoing, it's an ongoing project. Right now we are ending the project. We have two prototypes of open source hardware for uh, producing masks in an industrial scale. Uh, we are going to bring these designs tonight. This tonight, by, by, in, in five hours, we're going to open them. Um, this is just for the good. This is just an ethic work. We don't want to, I'm not an ambitious person. I don't want to make an international network, make a network just to grow like cancer, like big and big and big and big without the values, without a core of, of values that lead us to a good and ethical work. Um, I'm not interested in include everyone, every, every corporation, every, every, 
every group of people uh, working in open hardware because at the end of this 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 kind of work is not about open hardware it's about values um when i talk in english when i say this word solidarity everybody thinks i'm talking about socialism but i'm not talking about socialism i'm, I'm making i'm using this solidarity word because the solidarity is um, the key in the process of giving people these protections in english they say care we fuck care we need to care about each other but solidarity is must is distinguished from it we, we can make a, a distinction from care to solidarity even you can make a distinction between charity and solidarity we are not giving we are not in solidarity with everyone in, in the world because if we have to uh, be in this position of giving uh, of making solidarity is because there are other humans that are um, pushing in the other direction making profits when everybody needs uh, some help and not only because of the pandemic issue we know that it, there are collateral effects of the pandemic covid-19 is producing poor people uh, poorest people uh, in one century everywhere the unemployment in the US is the 32%. They are not going to pay the rents in July, like 28% of the people. They are, uh, we are aware that there are going to be 28 million homeless people in the US in the next year. And we need to work also for them because the, co the cooperation, when you, when you think about the old standards of cooperation, you always think about uh, giving the poor countries some help, um, but there is poor people also in the developed countries, also in the U.S. Um, and I want to tell you a secret. I started to think about this mask machine for industrial uh, uh, production because I saw these George Floyd um, demonstrations in the U.S. and I saw all these people protesting because some policemen killed. Um, a black person, black African person in the U.S., and I thought, oh, what, what the deal? Those people is going to be uh, uh, so, is going to be suffering COVID-19 because they are in protesting without masks, and I thought these people need some masks. So that's the reason why we started to make this symbio creation with Beno Juarez. And we want to develop these values and spread these kind of values. We don't want to spread the international make it network name like a brand we want to project and create and collaborate and learn and in diversity giving the the speech um, to the people who never talk giving the the microphone to those people because those are the real by the real core of our organization um, I'm really nervous um, I'm so sorry because I'm Sometimes I don't like to be in public because I don't like myself to be exposed. And also because I think the people need to, the people who never talk is that the people who really need to be here and talk, not the coordination, not the CEO, uh, but those people from Latin America who are real geniuses. And we never give them the opportunity to talk in public. That's all. Invite them. No problem. Great. I thank you a lot. Uh, uh, um, please stay with us because uh, uh, I think it, it, it's very important that you speak about the values because, you know, you can invent anything that works very, very well for very, very bad thing or just a few people. Or you can make differently things because you know what you want to live together or to be in. And it's not the same goal and it's not the same way of making things together. So I'm very, very happy to hear you uh, to speak about that. And we'll speak again about that just after uh, David and John, because what is very interesting is in that uh, we are going from some perhaps bricks or witnesses of actions about the reason of actions and the goals of the actions. And uh, as we may think, uh, it's a big question concerning taking care of each other in the field of health. And uh, perhaps it could be also uh, another one if we imagine 
that we could solve differently. Uh, many unpredictable problems we shall have on the common planet, for example, concerning the climate change consequences. So, uh, David, David, are you with us? Yes. David from. Yes, yes great. I let you speak now. I know you are. You, 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 your time is very precious. So thank you a lot to be with us. And as you see, we are coming from the uh, witnesses of actions to the goals and to the international dimension. So I'm very happy to welcome you here and to speak with us about the great open source medical supplies project. Well, thank you so much, Hugues, and uh, you know, thank you for bringing together this group of people. Um, I have yet to meet uh, most of you. And so I'm very, very interested to listen and learn about what you're doing. Um, I, I'm just going to follow Roberto now. And um, I really liked the things you were saying, Roberto, about you know, the international dimension and the recognition of voices that are often not heard. Um, the recognition that within a country, uh, there are many realities. Um, you know, the United States is, is, uh, is a leading country and a powerful country. And at the same time, within the United States, there are communities and you know, many, many people who have uh, serious challenges. I, I'm working with the American Open Source Medical Supplies as my title now, the Global Network Lead. So mostly working internationally with other partners. But I'm a Canadian and within Canada too. Um, you know, I've spent a lot of time in Africa recently in Kenya and people say, oh my gosh, Canada must be wonderful. And I go, hmm, yeah, sure, it's wonderful. So, so is Kenya, but, but within Canada, we have areas where people really are suffering and having a great deal of difficulty, even just getting clean water. So we can't have a single view of any place. Um, now, I've, I've prepared some responses to the questions that you asked in advance. So perhaps I'll just go through those. And uh, I wish that I could carry on this conversation with all of you, and perhaps I will be lucky enough to speak with some of you at a later date, um, but I will have to go at 11. So um, myself, I'm, I've said what I do with open source medical supplies. Um, primarily, I focus on work with international partners and a large team of ling linguists that we're working with in over 40 languages. Um, we, we want to share what we've developed uh, to others who might wish to have them. I was happy to share with you this morning a document of 160 pages or so, all in French, which is the, the primary information that we've gathered in our medical supplies guide with information for doctors and makers. It's our vision and our wish that we might receive also from France and from other countries uh, the wisdom that they have uh, developed through this uh, difficult crisis and so that uh, we can learn from those uh, information materials, uh, designs, uh, treatment uh, modalities, and so on, and all in regard to COVID. And uh, I share Hugues' vision of a world uh, connected and working collaboratively um, and with innovation in a fast learning way. Uh, to, to produce better health outcomes for people wherever they live. So uh, what, if, what is our community? Um, open source medical supplies in the United States uh, currently has 15 full-time staff. I'm one of those. And um, another way of looking at us would say uh, there may be 100,000 volunteers in the United States, good number in Canada, uh, that are involved in all the phases of designing, making, and distributing medical supplies and equipment, um, medical people, hospitals, organizations that we work with to help ensure that what we're uh, sharing is uh, accurate. And of course, that continually needs update and review. Uh, OSMS is an organization that in a sense doesn't make anything. Right, um, all, even although our founders and leaders are makers, um, we are focused on the information 
to mention. So we wanted to ensure that there was good information about what to make and how to make it, good information about how to diagnose COVID and how to treat it, uh, good information about how to uh, develop a logistical distribution network within your community um, and connecting people. Uh, this has uh, been our, our focus. Um, we have uh, been working with and learning from partners like the Fab Lab Foundation, uh, Tickham Ola Makers, Maker Fair, Field Ready, all multinational uh, organizations that many of you will know, and national organizations like Get Us PPE and Nation of Makers, among others. So things we've learned, Yves. Um, I wish now that the real makers on our team, people like Guy Cavalcanti, our founder, or Molly uh, Rubenstein, who both started with Makers Asylum a decade ago and uh, have continued in, in the maker field, because they would really give you lessons I think you all would, would find uh, much more interesting than what I can share with you. But what I can say is, we began without government agency involvement. And um, just simply using, you know, Guy's initial relationship with, was with, with a, uh, a doctor who was on the, the faculty of medicine at Stanford, had just returned from Wuhan, China, and had very up-to-date information, which was not generally available in the United States. And so we produced our first medical supplies guide with a small group, and then over time, we've grown and grown. Um, within a month, we had uh, the federal, the FDC and the CDC uh, contacting us and eventually working with us. Um, open source medical supplies has become a kind of a voice for um, small manufacturers, crafters, um, and makers. Um, in, in, in the United States anyway, maker tends to connote um, people who work in maker hubs, maker labs, and crafters are people who sew and do things like that. But all of them have been very important parts um, of the response and continue to be, as you know, we continue to have in the United States a major problem with COVID. We've also now been working with small manufacturers as well. Those who have adopted their production, um, adapted their production from what they were doing now to making medical supplies and devices where they can. Um, so in this information function, we're helping uh, makers uh, in their communities to identify possible sources of finance. Um, you know, just all the various dimensions that each of you will be familiar with, that the challenges that you work, that you, you find as soon as we find this is a challenge for many, then we, we set to work on it. Um, things we've learned, I, I, I focus on a couple. Um, number one, ongoing challenge, coordinating supply and demand. There are some makers in the United States that uh, to the best of their information, there's no need now for what they have. Um, there are other us who do need medical supplies and equipment, hospital groups and in areas um, uh, that aren't well uh, supported, uh, who are desperately seeking uh, what makers can produce. And so, you know, to coordinate these two sides uh, to make those connections, we see this as a very important uh, function that isn't well enough addressed just yet. And, um, I think actually I'll leave it at that. And I'll go on to, I know of which is a major focus for you, Ug, and very closely aligned with what we're thinking about and as we work with our partners around the world. Um, three to five bullet points. You say uh, to make the health solutions open and worldwide forked and made in the distributed and multimodal fabrication. Okay. So the first thing I would say is that we believe an international COVID-19 local manufacturers information network. It's a very cumbersome name. We can come up with something much better, but it's not up to me. It will be up to our global partners. That this is needed to facilitate collaboration across language and national boundaries. Uh, just on this call, I learned that the hospitals of Paris are planning to share also in English um, some of the materials they've developed. This is very exciting. Um, because 
I'm quite certain with the reputation of Paris hospitals that we will have excellent materials there that we can use in the United States. Um, but of course, in Russia, in, in uh, Ghana, in Brazil. Um, so this is exactly what we see, right? We see uh, a need for a sharing of information to make, uh, you know, we're, we have globally, uh, you know, I see Vibov here, right? Vibov, you actually shipped things to the United States. So I'm sure the people in the United States were very grateful to receive them. I don't have any doubt also that some of Vibov's designs have been picked up, maybe in the United States, but elsewhere in the world. Can we speed that up? Can we become faster learning? You know, in our brains, we have these neurons. They fire uh, with uh, the brilliant people that I'm sure you're working with, Doji, very quickly. Right? Make those connections. But globally, the information, it, it could flow more effectively, more quickly. And so how can we facilitate that? Um, I would say, you know, this fast learning, global network, it can be better. Another thing that we've observed is we're primarily a network of local, right? Local maker in Romania, for example. The makers in Romania made up most of the national supply of medical supplies that were needed in Romania. And where did they get their information? Well, they reached out via any tool they had, right, to find Czech designs, German designs, um, American designs, Indian designs, French designs. I don't know. But can we make that a better information sharing network? This is what we're thinking about. Um, also, I think um, we have these barriers of national boundaries, which are important for regulatory issues. Right? We all have come up against those barriers. Um, but also there are linguistic barriers that don't map exactly to national boundaries. So there's the Spanish world, there's a French world, there's an English world, a Russian world, Chinese world, and so on. So can we reduce those barriers? So as not to have to have this conversation, for example, in English, but in all the languages that are native to each of you. Um, and in our documents, in our information sharing, can we do that? So we've been working with an organization called Translation Commons, which is a nonprofit, and which is connected to something like 6,000 universities around the world, and produced a document for the World Health Organization in 6,000 languages. Think about that for a second, right? Because there are people in the villages who don't speak English or French, say, for example, in, um, you know, in, in, in a continent like Africa, you know, most countries, Arabic, English, French. But of course, in Kenya, there's 48 national languages and one of those has seven subdivisions. How do the people in the villages get this important information? So this is something that we're thinking a lot about and Translation Commons is working with the industry um, in translation to see if they can pull that together to make it possible for all of us now who are vital parts of this global health uh, issue, right, this pandemic, to communicate much more quickly and more effectively across the language barriers. So um, a final point to uh, the point of your main concern, I was lucky to be on a call with a man with um, the United Nations Development Program, the UNDP, and they're asking the question, is there a problem um, in many countries where we, we need medical supplies, you know, right now, but the national uh, standards bodies um, I'm the CDC in the United States, but the national standards bodies in those countries are maybe not very well resourced, maybe three people, right? But now there's a pandemic and they're being asked to say, is this device design okay? And it's, it's really challenging. So is there something they can do to support them? And they, they asked for feedback and all of us on the call thought, gee, this sounds like a good idea, a really good idea. Um, 
But I said, there are countries, and I won't name them right now, but uh, that I've been in touch with and talked with the makers there, where the government is actively hostile to them making medical supplies. And uh, surprising, but it happens. And for them, of course, it's a question of life and death. They're going to make medical supplies because otherwise the people in their community will not um, you know, get treated by doctors and nurses who are afraid to treat them essentially treating hundreds of COVID patients every day when you've got no PPE is a death sentence or might be, right? So, so they make them. But now the doctor in the hospital in that country is asked, um, you know, which of these designs is okay? What's, what do you want? And they may not have a good answer, but if there was a validation body which we as makers across the world could help with uh, through our partnerships. Uh, Philippe, I'm glad to see you're still here with, um, with the medical professionals. Um, this would be a second choice uh, within countries to the, their own national standards bodies, but at least the doctors in question would have a sense of confidence. So, um, if, it, if we had validated design. So that's still a, a, a loose idea, but it's, it's one that probably is going to move ahead because it's so important. And, and I would love it if we could collaborate together in helping to advise them on that. So that is, um, I probably more than 10 minutes eek. Um, again, I thank you for, for allowing me to come and uh, to present and next time for something like this i hope that you're treated to meeting Guy Cavalcanti or molly rubenstein who can speak more as a maker to you um, my background is a community organizer and a business person uh, so i just happen to be married to a very good translator and that's how i ended up doing a lot of this language work it's great thank you a lot and it's a great thing to have your your point of view and not point of view only of makers or fab labs. And that's what's interesting. I thank you a lot. And also I know you are uh, in the North now in Ontario and sometime yes. in the South, we met online, you were in Kenya yeah. uh, and, and we were working with the friends of uh, West Africa on the Maker and Source project. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, thank you a lot because uh, uh, I think we've got some very precious uh, elements uh, to think uh, uh, for the future uh, because the question is not uh, uh, to, to speak about technical things but to speak also uh, about vision of uh, what could be shared, how, with whom and uh, especially you, you said two things I think I, I, I will use in the debate because I know you must leave but uh, you said we don't do anything and, uh, and finally and uh, after you explained that uh, uh, information quality in the network was something crucial and you mm -hmm. spoke also of the question of the borders and I think we, we it's a very important question that the COVID pandemic reveals to many people is that sometimes the borders are not a solution sometimes the borders are also a problem especially when you want to share or to make quick standards mm -hmm. um, or have uh, government authorization to make something legal mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I thank you a lot and ah. all your team Molly, Sabrina and Tobias and all the team and so I will give the, the voice now to a, a man I respect a lot because when many people and many newspapers says oh uh, you discover you, 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 you discover the, that there are makers around you who made fantastic things who are making fantastic things in the COVID crisis I think perhaps the people uh, forget that um, there, are, uh, there is a network, perhaps the oldest I know, from uh, more than 2015, perhaps before 2015, uh, who uh, is uh, um, uh, making volunteers, uh, uh, making things with open source solutions in the field of health, not waiting for the pandemic and uh, COVID crisis. And uh, this network is uh, very uh, important because it's not a network who has two months but it's a network who has several uh, years with makers, with partners, with real people. Uh, and so I'm very happy to, to say hello to John Shaw.
founder of Enable uh, Network. And uh, John, please, uh, um, uh, we would be very interested. So you give you, perhaps you, you, you begin the phase of the debate by giving us uh, a look uh, on the story of the Enable Network, um, perhaps a point on the COVID crisis, uh, and perhaps your view uh, concerning the question of health. Uh, because you, you're perhaps one of the first big and worldwide network of makers working in open source healthcare. So, John, welcome. We are you. You are here, I hope. John Shull is here. John, one time. John, two time. Uh, yes, he's here, but I think he has an issue with his um, headset. It's fun. Can you hear you can me? Make in... Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's okay we now. see you. And we All right. You, Sorry. Um, I've been listening just in awe of all of these reports, um, but I, I have just discovered that my microphone was not plugged in. Uh, thank you. It was a very good introduction because uh, we have been doing this since 2013. What we have been doing is pulling together a global network of volunteers um, working on unmet needs of underserved populations. By the way, that's a hat tip to Roberto, who I think articulated some really important principles. Um, the population that we started with, and it, was, it, it all has sort of a funny accidental history, is a rare, a rare disorder. Um, people with uh, amputations, missing fingers or hands. Uh, and so we've been making 3D printed prosthetics. I imagine many of you know about Enable. We now have chapters in 150 countries. Chapters can be anything from one person to large organizations, larger than Enable itself. Um, and in recent years, we have been developing um, not just 3D printed prosthetics that make kids feel like superheroes, um, but also devices that are now modular and I think are going to begin uh, to be genuinely competitive, not just for children and those who have nothing, but genuinely competitive to commercial grade prosthetics. Um, it's an all volunteer group. And it was actually when I was uh, in France two summers ago that I began thinking about the fact that we are not an organization and that's important. Um, I call us, uh, I call Enable a no-no, a non-organization of non-organizations. And on the one hand, I think that's one of the reasons and one of the ways we've been able to do what regular enterprises have failed to do. Uh, regular enterprises mean governments and businesses and NGOs. And on the other hand, it's the reason we're still not, we as a, as a no, no, and we as a human race are still failing to reach most of the people who need these devices. Um, the, so I'm, I'm very proud with what we do. We're making progress, that's all great, but it's a very imperfect system in part because we have been sort of a niche community um, with regard to health and limb differences in prosthetics, but we also have been, I think, a um, leading edge community in trying to think about how can you coordinate what we realized years ago, to, somewhat to our surprise, is a global network of hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people who are ready, willing, and able to meet the unmet needs of underserved populations if only they can be given a way to do that. Now, that's the enable story as, uh, as much as I'm going to go into it. Uh, in, of course, the last few months, all of us have been uh, transformed by the COVID crisis and 15 or so of our chapters that I can name, and I suspect dozens more have also um, jumped into the fray and begun working on face shields. Uh, there, there's, I'll, I'll give one anecdote just to, just to tell that story. 
and it'll go back to the very beginning of Enable. When we started Enable, um, it, it started because I, just on a whim, published uh, a Google map that allowed people who needed a prosthetic to put a pin on the map and allowed people who had 3D printers to put a pin on the map. And I attached a note about that map to a video that was going viral about the very first 3D printed um, open source prosthetic hand. As that went viral, people put pins on the maps and things took off. Uh, my point there is that that simple map and riding the viral wave of the internet is how this whole thing came about. Everything that's happened since then is adapting to the conditions created by that fairly random and unplanned event. Um, we have been replacing that map or evolving that map. And so we have a map now of chapters around the world that people who are interested in finding the de uh, prosthetic devices consult that map, they find the relevant chapter or the relevant individual and um, they go through that matching process. The guy who developed our most recent map, a guy named Masvi Sferdiolis, is an Enable chapter leader and volunteer in Lithuania. And when the COVID crisis hit, he was asked to help coordinate a face shield making uh, enterprise in Lithuania. He created a secondary map that worked the same way. People who needed face shields put a pin on the map. People who um, were able to build face shields put, on a, uh, put a pin on the map. They ended up producing 15,000 face shields and they delivered most of the face shields in use in most of Lithuania's hospitals. Masvi also developed a map for Everton Linz in Brazil, where they have a terrible and not under control crisis, um, unlike Lithuania. Um, and using that map, Everton has coordinated the production of about 100,000 face shields, and they've now begun doing uh, injection molding. And that's the story of Enable in COVID. Now, this discussion makes it clear that the global network of volunteers willing and able to meet unmet needs of underserved populations is a, it's an international treasure. And it has, we don't have a social design yet that um, maximizes the value to society of that vast human resource. The COVID crisis has made it clear that the resource exists and the need can be intense and acute. And by the way, uh, I hope and expect that COVID will be an important uh, past chapter of human history in a year or two, but it's a dress rehearsal for climate and perhaps equity crisis that are obviously looming in front of us. This particular group and this, the video of this group, I'm so glad it's recording, I think is a great set of case studies that sort of support the claim I just made. And it seems to me this particular group of people is in a really good position to try to come up with a social design which will address this opportunity. And so, you know, since you've invited me, Hugh, uh, I'm going to just sort of give a few thoughts about the design. The challenge for Enable, and it's been sort of a paradox that I've been struggling with for a long time, is that our strength has been our character as a non-organization of non-organizations. Um, because we are a ragtag rag group of fairly uncoordinated volunteers, we have been able to circumvent most of the regulatory value barriers, circumvent many of the international barriers, and do things that conventional enterprises have failed to do 
because the reason they've failed to do it is because it doesn't fit their business model. Uh, it's very hard to profit from prosthetics. Otherwise, you have to make them really, really expensive. Therefore, only people with uh, significant financial resources, whether private or um, supplied by government or healthcare, and that's a small fraction of the of the world population. Um, therefore, most people are doing without upper limb prosthetics. There's no business model. We don't have a business model. We have volunteers who are rewarded by the, uh, the, the same values and satisfactions that Roberto articulated so well. Um, for, for many of us, for many of you, I'm sure, this, this work is the most rewarding work we've done. And we are truly fortunate to have the opportunity to do this work. And that is reward in itself. So one of the requirements of this social design is that we need to preserve and protect and grow a network that does not depend heavily on profit models and is not dependent, this is another important requirement I think, is not critically dependent on government support. Because as we are seeing in various governments uh, around the world right now, failures at the top are costing hundreds of thousands or millions of lives and are gumming up the system. Um, I think there are traces of that in places like the United States. I think there are place, traces of that in places like Brazil. There are traces like that all over and different crises are going to produce other breakdowns. So this global network, which is not dependent and frankly, therefore not controllable by the government is a crucial social safety net. We have to figure out how to, uh, I hesitate to use the, coord the word coordinate, but we have to figure out how to preserve, protect and grow that social safety net without turning it into a governmental organization, which we need governmental organizations, we need NGOs, but their very structure and their very, um, uh, their need for well-organized processes makes them less agile and less able to meet needs and come up with the new inventions that Roberto and, and others have seen. Governments, as I've said, we need good government, but of course we have found, we're seeing right now, that it's very hard to count on good government, even among exemplary good governments. I'm not talking about any particular country that I happen to belong to right now, but this is, we've seen this is a, um, a, uh, an international risk factor. And so it seems to me you need a middle layer. And the middle layer, and Philippe, I'm, I'm thinking about you, um, in particular, the middle layer is going to have, it, it will have to be, I think, adequately organized, adequately, um, not a no-no, okay, so, <laughs> so it needs to be a no-no-no and uh, a not a non-organization of non-organizations, but it has to be independent enough from the government that it can fill gaps when governmental processes fail. It has to be adequately um, values driven and uh, non-coercive that it will preserve and protect the, or not the autonomy of this global network of no-nos. And Maybe I'll stop there, but it, it seems to me that's, um, that's part, of the, part of the issue. Obviously money is really valuable. And I think that um, Vibab's case story and some of the others we've heard demonstrate that the economic value of this global network is huge. And the fact, I mean, it's fantastic that Vibab's effort has been self-sustaining but they also were at risk of failure. The funding 
of this global network of no-nos by governments when they are able seems to me to be an important part of the design as well. Maybe that's by way of the middle layer, but we need to find some way to do that without, by the way, um, causing the money to convert the no-nos into self-preserving organizations that are dependent on and organized around getting that support. Maybe it's distribution of resources, which is insurance against the, um, the insidious corrupting power of dollars. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's my, my description of Enable's history. I've tried to reinforce that, yes, we've been dealing with many of these issues for a long time and have been puzzling over many of the organizational challenges of no-nos in a world of governments and regulatory agencies, which all serve a good purpose when they serve a good purpose <laughs> and are a big problem when they're not serving good purposes. And a few thoughts about what this very group might be able to sketch going forward, which is a social design that will allow us to do much better what we have already proven we can do critically and well. Thank you a lot, John. Uh, so we have uh, about uh, 15 minutes uh, now. So for the people who are looking at this uh, live, uh, you can uh, ask questions, uh, no problem, we, we uh, raise them. Um, I noticed that uh, uh, I think it's very important. We came from uh, uh, witnesses from big regions like India, from PPA, to um, uh, clinical validations and experimental actions of exactly. uh, uh, health professionals, uh, to uh, the voice of our uh, brother and sisters from South countries, where uh, we do know that there is a real question of uh, um, uh, affordability of uh, medical devices. Uh, we've spoken uh, now of many interesting things, is that uh, uh, how to organize the kind of solutions or network who wants uh, to make or to imagine things because it has sense. And uh, 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 I think Roberto put something very important in, on the table with the reason why the people are making things or designing things or distributing things. But uh, now um, some perhaps things to, to launch the process. Uh, 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 John, you say uh, there are some uh, important qualities in a no-no, in, in, in a network that is not uh, only driven by the performance or competition, but by the sense and the willing of the people uh, to work together with a kind of uh, uh, on the fly uh, self organizing process that can uh, perhaps solve things uh, that are not solved by the existing organizations. Uh, what I noticed uh, in many countries' cases, not only in the COVID crisis, but in the, in the disability field, um, uh, I, I worked for four years. Um, with the makers, is that now for the moment, you know, uh, I, I know only in France one uh, leg wall company uh, designing and uh, wanting to uh, have an economical model on open source prosthetics that could be repaired everywhere. Only one, one, 1920, okay? One company, only one. When we spoke with the French government, they didn't ever have heard about hardware, opened medical serious solutions that could be validated in the health legal system nationally. Okay? It was new, totally new. Okay? So it means the world didn't make. Third, many of the people that were involved in the COVID crisis, they changed their life and they said, okay, from, to from today, I try to help as I can. And it's not their work. They are not paid for, okay? So the people who were, for example, designing things during the night, they were sometimes working on other things like pros in the day. And in the night, they were working to solve problems. They didn't make it for money. But if you wanted some people make it, should all this international scene have something legal that could protect, for example, the open source licenses? Could it be possible to have professionals who can build it or make forks in their countries legally? How? 
in theory, there are some public organization, not no no, like what else organization, for example. Can you imagine that, uh, uh, for example, for a vaccine, uh, only the people that can pay or the countries that can pay will be cured? Yes, because it's a market. So, so we are around the table, not only in this video conference, but many people have their mind who thinks from the beginning of the COVID crisis that many things are possible. So uh, I, I, I ask to myself, no. Uh, many of the things that have been made um, uh, will be illegal, perhaps, in six months, in one year, for example, in France, because sanitary emergency makes things for some things possible, some other things not possible. The, the needs are expressed by the people. Uh, the needs also of the people of the caring sector. Uh, um, uh, what do you think about that? Should we really set up kind of things like layers with no, no, and no, 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 able to have something who could be working for us, perhaps with uh, open source designs that uh, industrials and companies could make by millions, millions of devices, but you can fork at home and make it or not? Or do we play with the digital fabrication of only little factories, if we speak about open source, and can we make it with the existing people working? Or is it only things that volunteers make on their free time? Or could we imagine to make things legal and change things on the planet? If only, for example, 1% of the time of the people who are working on this planet, can be used to share legally solutions. Uh, is it a way that we could imagine that people, when they are going to work, they make things, comments, legally, for example, who could be used? As um, the question to everybody around the table. Yes. So it's a pretty large question. Uh, I guess on the, <laughs> uh, on the interaction between uh, governments and the um, and, uh, maker and like all this, uh, I, I guess government has uh, some lag where well, uh, since it's a very monolithic machine, it has some lag when there's new innovation or new ways of doing stuff. It lags behind all the time. So I guess like we did a lot of work to, to kind of integrate this um, fast prototyping, like to keep all the seriousness and all the security needed for medical equipment, but to integrate this kind of process. Uh, and also I think like in France, we, we have a lot uh, like our healthcare system has some pretty big depth. So anything that can reduce the cost of healthcare in general uh, and for, for us also, uh, is very needed. So, for example, paying 3,000 euros uh, like a syringe pump when it costs like 60 euros with the open source model I, I just shared uh, makes no sense. Um, and it's better to pay nurses or whatever than to, to send 3,000 euros to whatever a company didn't do. And, you know, like the technology for this kind of piece of equipment hasn't been upgraded for like 30 years. So, you know, the R&D costs are, are way, way uh, be, behind. So um, I, I guess like the French government is, is doing this, this kind of research, but after, uh, but there's, will, there will always be some kind of lag, you know? Uh, so I, I kind of speak like, it's, it's kind of strange for me to speak for the government, but I guess it's, it's my role here since I've got the more government style thing. Um, so yeah, there will be some lag and there will be some frustration when they catch up, but it's what monolithic institutions kind of do, you know, it's kind of like they are bad things. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Philippe. I know that David wants also to speak. David, we hear you. Yes. Uh, thank you uh, for the for the mic. Just for a moment before I, I have to go, um, uh, I won't I won't go on about how grateful I am. Although I'm very grateful for the contributions of everyone who's spoken. Um, Modu, we didn't hear you. Um, or I didn't anyway, so I, I'm sorry I missed you. But um, I'll just say the topic you've just raised, the topic that Philip has just raised, very important topics. 
I think that there's an important role for um, groups um, like uh, the Fab Labs, Réseau de Fab Lab de, uh, de France, and for your group, Roberto, in Spain, um, in, in interacting um, with the Spanish-speaking world, uh, with the groups here represented from West Africa. Um, and John, I'm leaving you out just for a second, because the, these are each groups that are organized by country. And we have regulatory differences within countries, which Philippe, you're alluding to. So um, if we come together and we have regular meetings and we, we can table each of these topics, like the one Philippe, you were just focusing on, um, we then can continue to work together and make progress on them. And um, this is something that you, you, were, you were one of the first that I've shared this humbly offered proposal to develop uh, an international COVID local manufacturing information network. Yes, it's just COVID now, but as John mentioned, uh, we have uh, other crises that our world will be facing, whether they grip the entire world, like a, a financial systems collapse, for example, or if they just grip a region of the world, um, you know, with global heating, uh, there are large areas of the world that could be really challenged. So having this network, what has come together now, can't be let to fall apart. But I know that we probably are all on this call thinking, yes, this is essential. How is it going to be sustainable? How can we really make for that cooperation across the boundaries of country and language so that this, what John called the no-nos, right? These informal, uh, willing, caring uh, people who say, okay, I will take responsibility in my community to take action. Um, you know, how can we uh, utilize the networks that we've developed now to take this forward? And so we think a lot about this at Open Source Medical Supplies. We realize we are just American, really, but there's an entire world. And now, really, can we, can we come together and become better organized? We've done extremely well. You know, um, just as you, John, with a minimum of organization have. Right, so this is the thought. Now there are also multinational organizations like yours, John, even although it's a non-organization and like the Fab Lab Network and other organizations that span many countries. And I'm sure they can advise us and help us. So uh, those, are, those are the thoughts I will leave you with. Um, having a very excited uh, conversation that is just beginning here. Um, and thank you for bringing us together, Uc, and for including us at OSMS in that. Um, I encourage anyone who wishes to reach out to me um, to do so, and we'll look at ways that we can collaborate together. Thank you, um, and I must go. <clears throat> thank you, David. I thank you a lot. I thank you a lot. This is uh, the end of this uh, talk. I want to say to uh, all the people who are curious or uh, in Fab Labs or makers or any, anybody who is interested in this field to, uh, uh, to, to take part uh, in his country, in his village, uh, trying to uh, understand, make and share things. And uh, the first lesson is that it's possible. I think it's very, very important to imagine that now what has, what has happened was possible with or without the government, because when the people, they, are, they have the sense, they know why they make something or they can do something, and then finally they are okay to share it. So let's make the conditions to offer to the world finally and to ourselves the solutions and not keep the solutions in boxes for the people who have the money to open them. That's my point of view, and I must give it. So to all the people, take care of yourself. I think we should also, like Vibaf, who has a very good communication, make anybody know that it's possible and perhaps show what is happening and try to push further the thing. 
I must say thank you a lot to the Fab Foundation, Anastasia Pistofilou, and all the speakers. Um, Asia is missing. It will not be the case the next time. I hope we could make a kind of round table growing with all the people who are interested in this field, because don't forget, we don't have only the COVID, we don't have only the pandemic, we have a world with many solutions to find and share, and we have seen that we can find them, and we can share them, and we can apply them. So thank you a lot, take care of you, thank and you. see you soon. Be courageous, Africa, Solidarity. Europe, Asia, USA, Canada, and all the friends of the world. Roberto, see you soon. I hope to speak together, everybody. Bye-bye from Brittany, France, and the French Fab Lab Networks. Loves you. Moudou. Moudou, my us. friend, you are here. You, you want to say John, the word of the end? Moudou from Dakar. Right yes, John. I'm Hello, here. Moudou. Nice to see you. It's a long time. Yes, bye-bye. Yes, I'm fine. Thank you. Take care of you, Maya. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. See you, Moulou. Sun Fab Lab. See you. Champion of Dakar.